Hey everyone, Junior here. Before I start this video, I have a few announcements to make. First off, I wanted to thank you all for enjoying my content. It truly means a lot to me that you all watch my videos. Whether you're new here or have been watching for years, I wanted to let you know that I appreciate every single one of you. Secondly, this is the most important thing. I know this pandemic has been rough on a lot of people, and some even more so than others. Recently, a friend of mine has come to me asking for my help in these difficult times. His name is Christopher Maxim, and if you've been a fan of my channel for a while, I'm sure you've heard his name before. He's a popular author in the internet horror community. Some of the notable works he's written are Never Use Cheat Codes on a Ouija Board, How to Exit Your Body During Sleep Paralysis, A Diner Open 25 Hours a Day, and The Axe Man's Lullaby. He also wrote tonight's story, Some Shooting Stars Aren't Meant to be Wished Upon. Chris suffers from ARFID, which stands for Avoidant Restrictive Food Intake Disorder. It's an eating disorder that has made him immunocompromised. Due to this, he had to quarantine himself from his full-time job indefinitely. He needs some help getting by and for treatment of his disorder. That way, he can strengthen his immune system during this pandemic. It's an expensive process, and he's trying every avenue he can for assistance. However, none have been fruitful, unfortunately. Chris has reached out to the Creepypasta community for help and has come to me personally. While I know times have been difficult for a lot of people, if any of you could donate to him to help him out, it would mean so much to me. He has provided a link to his PayPal for donations, which I will be placing in the description below, as well as at the end of this video. I will be personally donating to him myself to help him out. So if any of you could spare a dollar or two for him, I know it will be a massive help. Thank you so much for considering this and listening to the stories. You are the greatest fans I could ever ask for, and I'm so grateful to each and every one of you. I feel like I keep saying sorry and thank you over and over again. But without any more delay, here's the story. There it was. A fragment of the universe, hurtling through the cosmos. And there I was, gazing up from the comfort of a farmhouse rooftop, built by my father's hand smack dab in the middle of nowhere. In all the years we lived out there on the countryside, not a damned thing remarkable ever happened. This meteor shower was the highlight of my entire life. And that's why... With a bit of wonder glazed over my eyes, I wished on that one shooting star, brighter than the rest. I wished for some excitement. Almost as if in answer to my plea, the meteor took a U-turn and fell from the sky like a falcon diving for its prey. I watched astonished as it passed overhead and crashed into the wooded area behind my dad's property. Surprisingly, there was no sound, no explosion, just the rustling of tree leaves as it plummeted through the forest canopy. To make matters more peculiar, I swear I could see a red glow emanating from the crash site, however faint. After the initial shock wore off, I climbed down from the roof and raced into the woods, as fast as my scrawny legs would allow. I had a rough idea of where the thing landed, so I darted off in that direction, hoping I could take home a chunk of space rock as a souvenir to show my father. If I was lucky, it would be a treasure thrilling enough to keep him from getting mad that I went off into the woods by myself. I could only hope. Eventually, I came to a small clearing where the moonlight gently caressed the earth, granting me a somewhat clearer picture of the flora and fauna around me. I noticed many small animals, frantically scurrying north for no discernible reason. I surmised that the meteor's landing frightened the wildlife nearby, and so I decided to head off in the opposite direction. 
Sure enough, after maybe 10 more minutes of my impromptu hike through the wilderness, I came upon the source of the mysterious red glow I had seen before. It was no meteor. There, sitting in a small depression in the ground, was a metallic pod of sorts, complete with a blinking beacon protruding from its surface like an antenna. The craft itself was spherical, and at least twice my height. I had never seen anything like it before. I was utterly dumbfounded. Before I could take a closer look, a hatch opened from its side, startling me back into the woods. With a racing heart, I scuttled behind the nearest tree. I cautiously positioned my head around the trunk and spied on the object with bated breath. I didn't know what to expect. Was it some kind of top secret military weapon? Or perhaps a remote controlled gadget built by some genius hermit living nearby? Would a little green man step out to greet me, demanding to speak with my leader? No matter the outcome, my eyes were glued to that metallic pod, for better or for worse. A dark violet ooze spilled out from the object, forming a large puddle at its base. The slimy substance then scaled the pod, coating the exterior from top to bottom. As the slime moved around the sphere, the light above stopped blinking. All at once, the purple liquid was repelled from the craft and back onto the ground below. There, it began taking on a more humanoid shape. As the ooze changed, so too did its color. It became white and fuzzy, not unlike television static. Appropriately enough, TV and radio dialogue soon filled the forest. This thing was collecting signals from thin air, regurgitating lines from popular programs long since broadcast. At least, that's what it appeared to be doing. My mouth agape in awe, I began leaning forward without realizing it. The signals ceased abruptly, and I fell headfirst onto a pile of dead branches, creating a loud crunch beneath me. From my new vantage point, I watched the white figure turn to my direction. I then heard it speak. Who's there? Its voice was shaky and unnatural, a low, monotone growl coupled with a harsh reverb. Scared for my life, I picked myself back up and ran back home, faster than I ever had before. I reclaimed my perch on the roof and carefully surveyed the property. Once I was sure I hadn't been followed, I hopped through my bedroom window and climbed into bed, hoping that I'd dream the whole thing up, an adventure concocted by my imagination, running wild. I wished it were that simple but wishful thinking rarely plays out in one's favor. The following day, I came downstairs to the familiar aroma of eggs and bacon. My father always cooked up a hearty breakfast on Sundays. The sight I was greeted with upon entering the dining room, however, was anything but familiar. There, sitting at the table across from my father, was a man in a clean-cut suit, wearing a bowler hat and a striped tie. We rarely entertained visitors, so I was more than a little perplexed. Son, this is Mr. Grovewood. His car broke down a couple of miles up the road, so he's going to be staying with us for a few nights, just until he can get things sorted out. Well, how do you do, sport? I remained silent perturbed by the man's presence and still shaken from the previous night. Now, son, he's paying us a generous sum to stay here, so you best treat him with respect. My father glared at me in a way that effectively relayed his meaning. As such, I complied. I'm well, sir. Thank you for asking. The man smiled, albeit awkwardly, and I ran off outside to tend to the farm. I didn't know why, but I'd suddenly lost my appetite. Something just wasn't adding up. 
How did this stranger find the farm after his car broke down? We are literally surrounded by a forest. Dumb luck, perhaps? Doubtful. I was beginning to feel that his appearance the day after that thing landed in the woods wasn't a mere coincidence. But this wasn't a theory I had enough nerve to explore. After all, I had already convinced myself that the previous night's events were nothing more than a bad dream. The man would be gone in a few days either way, so I tried not to dwell on it. The next couple of nights were... Bizarre. Mr. Grovewood attempted to watch a sitcom with us while eating dinner but his reactions were less than normal. He seemed confused by the program and would only laugh after he noticed us laughing. And this wasn't just any laughter, mind you. It was a loud guffaw of intensely uncomfortable proportions. I was almost relieved when he got pulled away by a phone call from a business colleague, though I didn't hear a single word exchanged. The following night, I walked downstairs to the kitchen for a glass of milk, only to find Mr. Grovewood chowing down on a raw steak from the freezer. I asked what he was doing, and all he said was, Oh, this? It's just a little midnight snack. Trust me, a little color does the body good. Needless to say, I ran back to my room in a hurry, without my milk. Last night, however, is when I became truly afraid. Walking past the guest room to get out of the bathroom, I overheard Mr. Grovewood on the phone. This time I heard him speak. Did you receive the information I transmitted? Yes, this is the language we must use from here on out. We must avoid suspicion and blend in with the rest. It's a lovely place, rich in minerals, water, and organics. You and the others are going to like it here. So as long as you're ready, there's no going back from here. This will be our new home. No need. Why waste the material on transports when I can beam you down instantaneously? Besides, I already have two vessels here, and they are both ripe for the taking. Thank you all once again. Like I mentioned at the beginning of this video, if you could help out Chris with any donation, no matter how small, it'd be a big help. If not, maybe you could at least share this video so others might see it and feel generous. I'll be placing a link down in the description for donations again. Thank you all so, so much for listening. And I truly hope you're all staying safe out there as well.